we gather for worship in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your path, but have chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seats at the table. When met by those in need, we have too often passed by on the other side. Set us again on the path of life. Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. We are free to love as God loves. Amen.
we may steadfastly follow your paths through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Today, this third Sunday after Pentecost, is from the 19th chapter of 1 Kings, beginning at the 15th verse. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshai, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of abel Mehola, as prophet in your place. So he set out from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, who was plowing. There were twelve yoke of oxen ahead of him, and he was with the twelve. Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle over him. He left the oxen, ran after Elijah, and said, let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. Then Elijah said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? He returned from following him, took the yoke of the oxen, and slaughtered them. Using the equipment from the oxen, he boiled their flesh, and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out and followed Elijah, and became his servant. The word of the Lord. The psalm today is Psalm 16. Let us read it together responsibly. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, You are my Lord, my good above all other. All my delight is in the garden of the land. Among those who are noble, among the people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiply. I will not pour out a drink offering to such gods. Never take your names upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. I am not raising foes of a pleasant land. Indeed, I have a rich inheritance. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me, because God is in my right hand, I shall not be shaken. My heart therefore is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not be in the earth, nor let your holy ones see the fit. You will show me the path of life, in your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The second reading for today is from the fifth chapter of Galatians, beginning at the first verse. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the spirit, and what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, 
carousing, and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. The Word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But this one said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, Go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. There is a lot going on in this gospel, even if it doesn't seem like it. First and foremost, the gospel writer gives us an indication of what time this is in Jesus' life. It is towards the very end of his ministry here on earth. We are told that his eyes were affixed on Jerusalem. In other words, he was heading towards the cross. Now the interesting thing is, to get from where he was at to Jerusalem, they had to go from Galilee down south. They had to cross to the land of the Samaritans. And as we have discussed before, the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along. And that is because in around the 6th century BC, when the Babylonians came in and conquered all of that area, they took with them back to Babylon all of the powerful people, all of the well-known people in that area, not only the kings and the princes and the entire court, but they also took the philosophers, the teachers, they took all of the government officials, they took all of the people that, well, quite frankly, that might end up turning against them, and they took them all back to Babylon. Now the Jews that were left there were mostly the farmers and those people who worked the land in some way or another, but that left quite a vacuum in that area. And so other people would come in and they were all pagans or Gentiles, and they came into that area. And over time, those Jews that were left there began to intermarry. And we all know that once we get married, we can't help but take on some of the customs of our spouses. And that's what happened. And so their faith became a little bit of a mixed faith. And in fact, when the Jews came back from the Babylonian exile, they called Samaritans half-breeds. They had no use for them because they did not follow in the laws of God. Even though the Samaritans did in fact believe, they were the most righteous out of all. And so it got to be so bad that 
whenever you would have to travel through that land, you knew you just got through as fast as you could. You did not stay there. And yet Jesus walked into that direction. And two of his disciples went ahead to prepare a place for them. And we hear that the Samaritans rejected Jesus. Now we have to understand that those Samaritans rejected Jesus for one reason only, and that's because he was a Jew. But because of that rejection, because of that hard-heartedness, because of that profiling, if you will, they missed out on the Word of God. They missed out on all that Jesus had to offer. Because they were so thick-headed and hard-hearted, they were missing out on life eternal. Now we hear James and John got so upset with this, they said, Jesus, let us do another Sodom and Gomorrah here. Let us rain down fire and brimstone. That'll show them. But God and Jesus shows us something else, does He not? He shows mercy. It is mercy in a hope that maybe, just maybe, they might someday be able to hear His Word. He hopes that maybe, no matter how hard their hearts might be, that the Word of God might still reach them and that they still might hear that Word of eternal life. And for that, I rejoice. I rejoice because if we truly think about it, there have been times in our lives when we have rejected God. There have probably been many times in our lives when we have said no to God. I know that I've told you before, and you'll probably hear it more times anyhow, but when I was a young person, I went to, to church because that's what my mom did, and that's what my great-grandmother did. And I didn't want to disappoint either one of them. However, as I began to grow up, I began to grow a little bit away from church, and so our parents made us this deal. Go through confirmation. When you are confirmed, it will then be up to you what you want to do with church. And so, we made it through confirmation. I won't tell you how we made it through confirmation, <laughs> but let's just say we made it through confirmation. And so after I was confirmed at the age of 14, I decided I knew what I was going to do with Sunday morning. I stayed home and slept. <laughs> and that was the end of religion for me. I'm very grateful and thankful beyond all words that God indeed does not rain down fire and brimstone on all people who rejected Him, or I would not be here. In fact, I would dare say this church would probably be empty. You see, I had plans for Sunday morning, and God let me have those plans until a little while down the road after I met this beautiful person who would share the rest of my life. And we began to have children, and she said, we are going to church. And I said, have fun. And she said, no, we are going to church. And look what happened. <laughs> wicked sense of humor. But I am indeed thankful that God is a God of grace and mercy. That no matter how many times we've said no, no matter how many times we've turned away, that God still tells us that you are my beloved. That no matter what direction you've gone in life, I will be there with you. Hear my words. Feel my love. Know that that will never end. And hopefully one day we do just that. We hear those words and we feel that love. That love shown to us on the cross by what Christ had done. And so as he was affixed with his eyes on that cross, he continues through that Samaritan land. And we hear along the way people coming up to him saying, Jesus, I will follow you. Wherever it is you go, Jesus, I go with you. Well, Jesus knew where he was going. He knew what he would have to endure. In fact, we confess in our Apostles' Creed, as we do every week, that he suffered under Pontius Pilate. And the operative word there is suffered. That God in Jesus Christ suffered for all humanity. This man asking to follow him wherever he went. 
did not understand, nor could he understand. I believe it's because he probably had seen Jesus before. He had probably seen the miracles that had happened, and he probably had happened to notice his faithful disciples with him. And let's face it, wherever Jesus went, he was like a superstar. And because you were a disciple of his, well, you got treated very well also. And so he was probably thinking, that's the kind of life for me. I'm going to be a follower of Jesus. Because these guys get taken care of. These guys not only listen to Jesus and follow with him, but all of that praise and adoration, well, they feel it too. Kind of reminds me of a lot of these TV evangelists and all of these people who've gotten rich because of their faith. And yet Jesus himself would tell them, look, I am the Son of God. Even the fox has a hole to go to and the birds have a nest. I, the Son of God, have nowhere to lay my head. In other words, if we are followers of Christ and we are truly following Him, that earthly possessions and certainly money is not part of the game. If anybody would read the scriptures, they would understand that to be a follower of Christ, we would not expect our bank accounts to explode. We would not expect to have two or three homes. We would not expect to be wearing suits that cost more than I get paid in a month. We would not expect to get rich off of Jesus Christ. And yet, I think there are some who have had that idea, and some who have done just that. And yet, I think they have no clue as to what it is that Christ calls us to do and be in this world. That we are to be a mirror of Him. And that means, yes, there are going to be times that we are called to go into places that we probably don't want to go. And that we will be confronted with people who would stand in opposition to us. And yet, the whole time we are in these areas, God tells us, you will not be alone. Trust in me, and I will go with you. And the message he tells us is the same message as he gives all people. To love God and love your neighbor. And when you do that, you need not fear, because then everything will fall into place. But you need to trust me on that you need to know that is my word. And my word is indeed real. Well, we have some other folks who are coming up to him and saying, Lord, I want to follow you. But, that but gets pretty big, doesn't it? But, I need to go home and bury my father. Well, let's look at this. Jewish law indeed does say that bearing of a loved one is prime consideration. It's almost like a prime directive for any of you Star Trek fans. But it is the prime directive in the life of those who believe in the Jewish faith. That burying their loved ones, especially parents or spouses, would take precedence over everything else. And if this was a devout Jew, which I'm sure it was, he would not be talking to Jesus. He would be making all the funeral arrangements. So therefore, this man's father was still alive. So that got to be a pretty long but, did it not? I will follow you, Jesus, but my dad's only 25. We've got a few years to wait. In other words, Jesus, I'm going to put conditions on how I follow you. Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. You see, those who do not follow Christ, those who do not know His Word or hear His Word, those who refuse Him, will be dead. They will be dead to God. But they continue on, and on the road we have another one. Lord, I'm ready to follow you, but let me go back and say goodbye to my mom and dad. Another person who wants to follow Jesus, who wants to put conditions upon that following. And again, I cannot come down too hard on these people because I have done the same. We have done the same. Yes, Lord, I will follow you for one hour during the week. I will follow you every Sunday morning into worship and out of worship. I'll give you that much. 
but then you're going to help me for the rest of the week. Or yes, Lord, I will be here on Sunday morning and I will serve on committees and I will do other things, but hey, I've got a life to lead. I've got to go to work. I've got my social time. I can't miss football games. And yes, you're going to find me with a beer in my hand, God, so you might as well get used to it. We put these conditions on following God, don't we? We all do. If we say no, we're lying. And let's face it, God knows everything. He's kind of like the proverbial mother. You know, the one where you'd be out in the neighborhood and you would do something, <laughs> even though no one else was around, by the time you got home, all already knew. And you could tell by the look on her face, she knew exactly what you did, so you may as well confess anyway. Well, God knows. God knows that we limit our following. God knows that, let's face it, we are sometimes selfish. Sometimes we need me time. Sometimes we need to just get away. Sometimes we need to just recharge. And yet if we truly were honest about that, that is when we would spend the most time with Him. In His Word. Hearing that Word. Being recharged by the Holy Spirit so that we could bear fruits worthy of our calling. And yet we, along with many others, have that big but. Yes, Lord, but. And Christ, Christ will tell us simply this. I don't want you for an hour a week. I don't want you for an hour a day. I don't want you for three or four hours a day. I want you for always. I want you to be committed 100% every moment of every day. That is what I'm asking you to do, but I'm not going to ask you to do anything that I would not do myself. And therefore, I continue on the road to that cross. And if you are to follow me, then you will pick up your cross and walk with me. He doesn't tell you it's going to be just for a mile or two miles. But rather, He is asking us to pick up our crosses and follow Him every moment of every day of our lives. And yes, He will lead us into some places that are going to scare us. He's going to lead us to meet some folks who will stand in opposition to us. But He will also remind us that we are not alone. And that if we do as we have been commanded, then we will get through this together. Love God. Love your name. It's that easy. And it's that difficult. But if we trust in the one whom we follow, then we need not fear. For God will lead us. And God will give us all that we need. You know, being a disciple of Christ is not an easy calling. In fact, when we look at the original twelve, many of them actually lived to be old aged. One. And he was exiled on an island to be alone until he died. The rest of his disciples ended up dying at the hands of others in ways we won't want to imagine. And that is the calling of a disciple. I have never read anywhere where any of them got rich or any of them sold a million books or made television shows or anything else. What I did read is that they were committed to sharing the Word of God with the world. They were willing to go where God led them and they were willing to do all that was needed so that people who would listen might be saved. They did so without fear for their own lives because they knew that God was with them. And even if it meant their lives, they would then be with God. But either way, they had nothing to fear. You see, we can't be so concerned about earthly things that we forget that we are heavenly people. That the end game is not to end up with the most money in our IRAs or 401ks. It doesn't matter how many cars we have, what kind of house we live in. This is just short-term living here. That our goal 
is that heavenly home that Christ has promised us. That all who are in obedience to His will, that He promised that He would go and prepare a place for us in His Father's kingdom, and that one day He would return and take us back with Him. That is the long-term goal. That is what we aim for as Christians. To love and serve others in the name of Christ. To be a mirror of His grace and His mercy. To do so without expectation of repayment, but trusting only in what God has already given us. Life now and life eternal. That is the God that I follow. I'm willing to pick up that cross. I'm willing to go wherever it is that He sends me. Because I don't go alone. I walk, and sometimes I stumble. But I know that when I do stumble, I have someone who is walking with me that will pick me up, dust me off, and help me go on my way.
He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last Amen. United in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for this church, the creation, and all in need. God of faithfulness, set the face of your church firmly on you. Rooted in your self-giving love, may the church find freedom in loving our neighbors. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of gentleness, strengthen the earth's ability to heal. Where there are dangerous storms, bring calm. Where there are destructive fires, bring rain. Protect homes, habitats, and livelihoods threatened by climate disasters. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of peace, guide all who govern, that they place the good of their citizens above self-promotion. Anoint leaders of nations with your spirit of neighborly love. Protect refugees and all who live under tyranny or conflict. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of kindness, reveal your healing presence to all who are sick or dying. Uphold those who grieve. Support the needs of any who are unemployed, hungry, or have nowhere to lay their heads. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of love, attend to those struggling with addiction, depression, or uncontrolled anger. Provide support systems and loving companions as they work toward health, that they may rest in hope and know the fullness of joy in your presence. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of joy, we give thanks for all who have died and now celebrate the inheritance of life in you. Keep their examples of faithfulness always before us, that we trust your promises in life and in death. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, though we at times turn away from you, you still love us. You still want us to be part of your family. We give you thanks for that mercy and grace that we do not deserve. Help us, Father, especially in these times today, that we do not rush to judgment upon anyone that we withhold anger and hatred, that we replace it with love and grace. Help us, Father, to look upon each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us remember, Father, that the word is always to love one another. Heavenly Father, we lift up to you today in love all of those whom we pray for but especially those that we name out loud, Father, we ask for healing and restoration to wholeness. We pray that you might calm any anxiety and fear, and we ask most of all, Father, for your presence in their lives. We lift up Lisa, Cindy, John, Betty Sue, Norma, Eloise, Fran, Jim, Sue, Dick, Samantha, Suzanne, Jim, Noni, Elizabeth, Brad, Tina, Kim, Patty, Sandy, Amy, Vera, Katie. Heavenly Father, we ask that as you've been with Hazel and continue to be with her, we pray especially now as she has just fallen and broken her hip. We pray, Father, that she is restored to wholeness, that even though she might be immobile for a while, let her know that you are there with her every step of the way. We lift up Amber, Dustin, Maurice, Rob, Maria, Gia, Mark, Gary, Jeff, Bill, 
Avis, Bishop Lozano, Pastor McCalvary, Wanda, Linda, June, Lucy, Ryan, Darlene, Erzabet, Bensu, Rosa, Darlin, Renetta, Jennifer, Emily, Andrew, Claudia. We lift up Linda, Debbie, Mervyn, and John. God of every time and place, in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit, we entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts into your holy keeping. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. took the cup, 
gave thanks and gave it for all the drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this also for the remembrance of me. Remembering therefore his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share in this heavenly food, this body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
life-giving God, through this meal you have bandaged our wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Receive now the blessing of God, the God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life this day and always. Amen. Amen.